Alright everybody, uh, welcome back. We have another uh, rewatch video. This one for episode 7 of the Wheel of Time TV show. And uh, I guess uh, to get right into it, first of all, spoiler warning. Because this is a rewatch uh, video, obviously spoilers for the entire first season of the Wheel of Time. And as far as book spoilers go, I'm going to say spoilers through to Winter's Heart, which is book nine, I think, of the Wheel of Time uh, book series. So if you have watched the entire first season and you have read the first nine books in the series, you are good to go. If you have not, bye-bye. Get out of here. I hate the idea of spoiling people, so go away. That feels so weird. But the rest of you, I guess, uh, we are good to go. So let's get into it. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. Let's be nerdy. Episode 7, Cold Open. I think it goes without saying that this is incredible. Uh, when I first watched this, of course, I watched it at home, as you do. And then uh, I have a friend who has like a, a TV that's like the size of my bed. It is a massive tele I don't. I didn't, I didn't even know they made TVs that big. And uh, so the next time I was at her house, I was like, can I, can I just watch uh, The Wheel of Time? She's like, you want to watch an entire episode of television while you're at my house? I'm like, no, no, just, just three minutes. I just want to watch this three minutes on your big TV. And I did. It was amazing. I want to see it like in a theater. I want to see it like in a full like IMAX screen or something because... Oh my god, this scene is so good. And if you, uh, sorry, again, always apologies for traffic. I can't do anything about it. Um, but uh, if you have access to the behind the scenes, the uh, x-ray footage, watch the x-ray for this one. It's really, really cool. That They talk about the fight choreo choreography and the uh, the camera that they use. They use a special, like a bolt camera for this. It's, it's really amazing. Also... Again, going to recommend the Wheel Takes podcast. Uh, when they talked about this episode, uh, you know, uh, Gus and Ali, who host the Wheel Takes podcast, uh, they are in the business. Like they work in, uh, Ali works in script writing and television. And Gus, uh, I know he has, I think, a background in uh, stage fighting, so like stage fighting and fight choreography and that sort of thing. So they were able to talk about this quite knowledgeably. And it was really, really interesting. Also, just going to point out this actress, uh, it's a stunt performer. I think she's a Czech stunt performer. She... She is amazing. I'm, I know some people were really upset that she fought Unveiled, but I, I would not want to have missed this performance. Like, her performance during this whole scene, it's, it's amazing. And that's just, like, actors have to show their face. They ha like, that's part of the tools they have at their disposal. We cannot be inside their heads, or we can if they can show their face. Their face is how they show us what's going on inside their heads, right? So it's very, like, it's, it happens so many times in movies and television that, you know, people will have their helmets on and then for an important scene where in real life you wouldn't take off your helmet because you'd be in danger, but in television you do because people need to see your face. It's part of, it's part of what you're doing as an actor. And I know right now somebody's like, Mandalorian, because that was what was in my comments the first time I brought this up. And Mandalorian, I'm going to say, exception that pro proves the rule. Also, a special case. Like, I I haven't seen the whole series of Mandalorian, but he does not emote a lot. Like you don't get a, he, he tilts his head. It it's it's kind of that show's hook. It like that. It it's a special case. It's not something that you can apply to all things. It's special and it works only in the environment of the Mandalorian. You could not take that and then put it in another show and be like, no, no, you don't need to actually act. Just tilt your head. That's it. <laughs> like. No, it's not going to work. So, yeah. The real world reason for why she's unveiled is that actors need to show their face. But this time around when I was watching it, I did this thing that I do sometimes. When I'm, like, reading a book or watching a movie and then there's, like, a... I don't want to say necessarily a plot hole, but maybe, like, a, a hiccup in the plot or something. So, in this case, I started to think about, like, the in-world implications of her taking off her veil. And I was wondering about Aiel etiquette. Like, in... If Aiel were fighting and one of the Aiel took off their veil, I'm going to, like, I would imagine that the rest of the Aiel would go, okay, they're not fighting anymore and would not fight that person. So I would think in, if I'm, like, t putting an in-world explanation for what happens here, she sits down, takes off her veil, and in her mind thinks that she has signaled, I'm not fighting. 
right? And Ayo being the ethnocentric people that they are, like, they think everybody should, like, why don't you just speak the words to your wise ones? People in the wetlands don't have wise ones. <laughs> what, what are you talking about, Bain and Chiad? But anyway, um, that, uh, so that she would think she has signaled to these wetlanders, I am not fighting. So then the indignity and the shock of the fact that in that moment where she has signaled that she's not wanting to fight, that they would keep attacking, that would just add to the trauma of this moment, I would think. I don't know. I don't know if they put that much thought into it, but that's what my brain is doing. It's just, oh my gosh, that makes it so much worse. That she's thought that she has said, no, I'm done. And then a bunch of men keep attacking her. That would make, like, it's already a horrible situation. It would make it worse. Uh, okay, so we have a conversation here about this inherent darkness thing in Matt. And I found myself wondering how much of that inherent darkness was part of the original script. Like, or, or I don't know, show canon. And how much was added because of the necessity of, you know, the situation, having lost Barney Harris. Like, Okay, I know that this dialogue was obviously added because they had to explain Matt's absence, but what I mean is, like, okay, she says, there's an inherent darkness in Matt that was feeding off of the dagger as much as it was feeding off of him. I, uh, I don't know, okay, something like that. I wonder how much of that was meant to be part of the story, or did the show version of Matt's character actually change because of the loss of Barney Harris. And I'm hoping that this question makes sense outside of my head, because I know what I mean in my head. And I don't know if it's coming out in a way that is coherent at all. Um, but yeah, I'm just wondering if it has had like a, more than just the fact that the actor is going to change. I'm wondering if it has had a, an impact on the character of Matt Coffin. I've said this before, I know I have, but it still cracks me up. Uh, Loyal starts to list here terrible ways to die and gets cut off by Rand and, Rand, I want to hear Loyal's list. I want to hear like the top five terrible ways to die on Loyal's list. Okay, <sighs> again, the reveal uh, later on in this episode about Perrin's feelings for Egwene. And yes, I know they're just a crush. I'm not thinking he's in love, but they they color things for me. The first time I saw this scene, I thought, you know, the scene where he's watching Egwene and Rand cuddle, I thought, oh, poor, poor Perrin, he's missing his wife, you know, who died a month ago, and he's wishing that he could be cuddling with the, his wife, again, who died a month ago. But now, when I watch it, I think I'm supposed to make a connection between this and the reveal later on, and think, oh no, he's jealous of Rand, or no, oh, he wishes he could be the one that's cuddling with Egwene, and I... I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not that I don't think married people can have crushes. I know that that's a thing that happens. It's fine. People are human. You don't, like, put a ring on your finger and immediately lose your peripheral vision. Like, uh, I know it's realistic, but this is a story. It's not real life. And if, if you put something in a story, I feel like it should have a purpose or it should serve some function in the story. And so far... To me, anyway, the only function this serves is to to ruin or, I don't know, to add a bad flavor to every Perrin and Egwene interaction that we've seen thus far. However, <laughs> it occurred to me that this could be setting things up for later. And Perrin having a jealous wife in Fahil, because in season one he has a jealous wife in Layla, and Layla has a reason, and Fahil has a reason, and oh, it makes me so nervous. Because I... <sighs> I have so many issues with how that particular plot is handled in the books, if I'm honest. And I had kind of hoped that the Berylaine file parent f would just not be in the show. Because in the books, all it does is make all three of them look bad. Like, Berylaine is supposed to be this incredibly competent, incredibly intelligent woman and leader, and she is throwing herself. She is actively trying to steal a married man who does not want her. And... I, I, there's lots of discussion about, oh, but in her culture, maybe he's not giving the right signals. She's a queen, or she's the first of my end. She's a diplomat. She deals with other cultures. She should be able to see that he doesn't want her. She's being pretty clear. And he should be able to communicate it to her that he doesn't want her. And he also should be able to communicate to his wife, hey, I don't want this woman. She is throwing herself at me. You Please. But he doesn't. Instead, he relies on his 
stupid empathic abilities that he hasn't told anybody about, and he's reacting to Par- or, or Fael's emotions, but not telling her that, that that's what he's reacting to. So Fael is like, what the heck is wrong with my husband? Why is he acting so sus all the time? Because she doesn't realize that he's reacting to her emotions. And she actually has a reason to be jealous. It's so frustrating to me how, the amount of hate that Fael gets. And I am not a Fael stan. Okay, a rant is incoming. I didn't realize. Uh, I'm not a Fael stan. But the amount of hate that she gets for feeling jealous when she actually has a reason. There is a woman actively trying to steal her husband. She's not crazy. Fael is not crazy. She's There's something happening, and she can't seem to do anything about it. And Barrelane gets off scot-free, according to the fandom, and Perrin gets all the pity, and Fael gets all the hate. When of these three, she is probably the biggest victim because she's having her autonomy, like her, her private thoughts violated by her husband all the time, but she doesn't even know that. And she's being bullied by this person who is trying to steal her husband and she can't seem to get this woman to leave her alone. And, uh, every, everybody in that trio looks bad. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't, don't like the way it's written. I don't like what it says about the characters. I don't like the, uh, implications for how women interact with each other in the books. I I was hoping that it was not going to be there, but the reason I'm talking about it now is it's the only reason I can think of to include or to highlight this, because some people do see a Perrin, a Gwen thing in the books. The only reason I can think of to, to have it be a part of the show is if you're planning for this in the future. Okay. Uh, so here we have, I, I would put the audio in, but nobody, you wouldn't be able to hear it. I would have to like blow your ears out with the sound. We hear Fane's whistling here. And so far, uh, none of my friends who didn't, like all of the people I know who watch the show without reading the books, none of them have caught Fahil's whistling. Now, maybe my friends just aren't the type who would pay attention to that, but I'm, I'm curious because most of the people I know who have read the books caught it. And I'm wondering... Uh, there's no way to know. This is another one of those things I'm curious about that I can just never know. But I'm curious about the percentage of people who caught it versus people who missed it. Because, like, it happens three times, right? We hear him in episode, in this episode, we hear him in episode uh, five. Or we see him in episode five. And then uh, we hear the whistle again in Shadow Logoth, which I think is episode two. So, I don't know. I'm curious as to, like, the breakdown of who caught it and who missed it. Okay, we have this emaciated Trollic, and, okay, I, the first time I saw this, I did not realize it was a Trollic until Lan said it was a Trollic, right? It just, it doesn't read Trollic to me, I guess, because it is so emaciated, but every time I've rewatched this episode, it's been tickling at the back of my brain as to, oh, it reminds me of something, what does it remind me of? It reminds me of something, and this time around, I realized what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm such a nerd. Uh, if you watched Babylon 5, <laughs> like back in the 90s, uh, Babylon 5, this Trollic kind of, kind of, like vaguely, but it was enough to tickle my mind, <laughs> the back of my brain, kind of looks like Zathras, who's good, and this Trollic is bad. But I like Zathras, but that's what, yeah, <laughs> that's what this Trollic looks like. I still love the way they handled Machinchin in the show. Like, I, I, I uh, I would have loved to have heard the gross stuff from the books, but I think that this was so much smarter for the show because it gives us a glimpse into their internal lives. I still think it's fantastic. It's incredible. I also, this time around, I noticed the the mirror between Moraine and Nynaeve. Both of them have fear about the Two Rivers kids dying. Like, Moraine's is about how she's going to get them killed, which is something that she doesn't want. Like, it's a roundabout way of saying that she wants to protect them, knowing that she can't. And then, of course, Nynaeve's is that you can't protect them, they're all gonna die. Nynaeve and Moraine have the same fear. <laughs> like, it's... Oh, I said it in one of my earliest videos on my channel. <laughs> Sorry, it's so hard to go back and watch my early videos, but one of my earliest videos on my channel was a Nynaeve video, and in it I said something about Moraine and Nynaeve being opposite sides of the same coin. And this is an example of that. They they have the same fear, but I think Moraine would guess it because Moraine has the life experience and the knowledge and the maturity to know it. Nynaeve has no idea. Nynaeve, she still sees Moraine as an antagonist. She sees Moraine as such an other when they are way more similar than they realize. And I know I mentioned this before because I, I do love it, but I love the ambiguity in Lan's fear uh, when he says, you can't, you won't be able to protect her or something. And I, 
I don't know if this is what they meant, but I love it as a, just, it's my headcanon that the ambiguity was part of the torture, right? Because for the past 20 years, his primary focus has been protect Moraine, protect Moraine. And now that's being divided. And that would be like that fundamental of a shift in your life's purpose and goal. That would be unsettling at the minimum. So I don't know. I love it. I got literal goosebumps this time around when Nynaeve exploded. Like, oh, just all over my body, just goosebumps. Oh, it was incredible. Uh, I know I did mention this before, but I, I do love the contrast between Nynaeve and Moraine's channeling, where uh, Nynaeve's is explosive. Like, it's just a, a ball of light. There is no precision in it, whereas Moraine's is all precision. Like, it's all precise movements and detailed and precise actions. But their movements also kind of mirror each other. Like they, they are doing the same moves in a dance, but just slightly like, ah, it's good. Like I'm going to have it up here on screen, but you can see they're mirroring each other in their movements, even as one of them is doing it with precision and the other one is doing it with just flailing. It's wonderful. I love this show. The nod that Moraine gives to Nynaeve here, like when she comes out of, when they come out of the ways, Nynaeve, or Moraine says to everybody, well done. She says to all of them, and then she gives a specific nod to Nynaeve. So it's obviously a well done everyone, especially you. Obviously it's a thank you. And I wish Nynaeve could take that to heart. I know she won't, she can't, but I wish she would. All right, this next one, this is a scoop Worthy of a braid watch video, but you all don't know how hard those videos are to make. And it's really, I only have this one thing to say, so it's not really worth an entire video, but, huh. When did Perrin get a haircut? Hmm? Like, I'm sorry, he had dreads, like short dreads, but he had dreads before they got into the ways. In the ways, I was, I went back and checked, like, it seems like he had dreads in the ways. It's very, very hard to tell because it's very dark hair against a pitch black background. But here, he's clearly got the short twist that he had, like, way back in episode one. Did he, did he cut his dreads off in the ways? What? <laughs> like, okay, I, of course, I know what this is, right? Like, this is, uh, oh, we had to shut down for COVID for, like, six or nine months, whatever, and his hair changed in that time. But in world, like, it's the same thing where my brain is like, what? I, okay, I know the real world explanation, but in world, is there an explanation that can explain how Perrin got a haircut? Because what? Hey, guys. All right. Editing Lesby jumping in. Uh, this is probably the most accurate version of Editing Lesby because I'm about to discuss something that I discovered today while editing. All right. So you just watched me say that uh, it's hard to tell whether or not Perrin has dreads in the ways because he's got dark hair, black background. They are melding into each other. But while editing, I thought, and you just saw, you might have noticed, I, I thought I would try and brighten this clip up to see if you could tell whether or not Perrin has dreads. And he does. And I saw that and at first I went, cool, all right, proved he had dreads in the ways. And then I had a moment where I like looked at that scene and went, oh my god, wait, that's the Machin Shin scene. They filmed the Machin Shin scene while he still had dreads. They filmed the Machin Shin scene before they had to shut down for the pandemic. They filmed the Machin Shin scene with Barney Harris still there, with Matt. They probably filmed this whole ways sequence with Matt and then had to go back and redo it and then re-edit and recut things to adjust for the fact that they lost a major cast member. What I'm saying, first of all, is I think we have actually underestimated the amount of rewrites and reshoots and adjustments and stuff that they had to do because, again, they lost a main cast member in the middle of filming, which is a big deal in and of itself, but just seeing this and realizing they filmed this and then had to go back and refilm it again and then recut and re... That's major. And then secondly, oh my God, somewhere there is a version of this way sequence with Matt and Matt would have been there hearing Matt Chin Shin. What did Matt Chin Shin say to Matt? I, I want to know that now. Like, Obviously, this is not going to be show canon, but I am very curious to know what the writer's original intention was. And it just, this is blowing my mind. This is blowing my mind. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, the evidence is there. It's in parents' hair. That rhymed. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. But it's, ah, 
I don't know, maybe this isn't as much of a big deal to you as it is to me, but for me, this was like, holy crap, holy crap, Th- ah, this is, that That was a bigger change than we thought it was going to be, like, wow, Uno, not much to say except just Uno, <laughs> love Uno, oh. oh, okay, in my notes, I actually do have something to say. They are setting Uno up to be a good friend of Lan's, which is going to be really cool later on. We get, uh, Nynaeve and Uno together. Like, we're, we better get that together. That's uh, going to be, oh, yes, I like that. That makes, a like, an extra connection between them, which is really cool. And, oh, my God. Sho Min is hot as hell. Like, oh, my God. If anything, we're going to give me show goggles in the Grinwell Cup. And uh, Okay, if you don't know the Grinwell Cup, again, why aren't you listening to the Wheel Takes podcast? You should be listening to them. But, <laughs> They, whatever. The Grinwell Cup. Go look it up. It's a Twitter thing. Um, if anything was going to give me show goggles, it would be this casting for Min, because show Min. Oh, she's so hot. She's so hot. Oh my gosh. I'm pretty sure, not 100%, but I'm pretty sure that the baby in this vision of Min's is the same baby. Like, it's the same doll or the same actor baby, whatever, as the baby used in the finale. I'm not 100% sure because it's transparent and not in close-up, but I I think it's the same baby. So I think we've actually already seen this uh, viewing come true. Okay, so uh, this fight over Matt. What do you think this fight was originally supposed to be about? Uh, Matt was, you know, obviously supposed to be here, right? And I'm assuming that they were supposed to have a fight about something so that they could be, there could be some conflict for parents' crush to come to light in the, in the middle of the conflict. So what do you think the original plan for this fight was? My guess, and I am not good at guessing, but my guess, my brain is still trying to put Matt in the middle of it. And I don't know why, but my, my initial guess was Maybe he would be trying to convince people to, like, run away with him or something? I don't know. What do you think? I hate this reveal of Perrin's crush, but I still love Nynaeve's reaction to it, like, to realizing what she's done. Zoe Robbins, it's just, it's amazing acting. She's so good, and this is so Nynaeve, right? Like, to do or say something without thinking, and then and then regret it and have to deal with the consequences. That's, that's Nynaeve to a T. Then, then we get this scene that's still makes me cry, and I still can't quite put my finger on why. I've had a couple of theories presented to me in the comments, the most common one being that I identify with Nynaeve, and so hearing this from Moraine feels like like affirmation or praise that I need to hear. And maybe, I guess, I don't know. I, I mean, I obviously love Nynaeve, right? That's, this is not a shock to anyone who has watched any of my channel, but I always see Nynaeve as more of uh, she's more aspirational than a, a mirror of me, right? Like, I think of us both as uh, insecure people with a lot of anxiety, but her reaction to her fear and anxiety is action, and mine is is the opposite. And her reaction is not always good. Her in, in this scene, we see her reaction like her she she does something stupid. Her reaction is not always good, but I feel like it's better than mine. I'm an inc- I'm so passive, and in and moments of anxiety, I shut down. Where she does something, and I feel that that is a healthier response. I I feel like, I don't know. I feel like it might be a combination of things. Like it could be my wishing that Nynaeve could know this, but I also I feel like I'm feeling Moraine's love for Lan in this moment, and I I do just I love a strong friendship. I also, I don't know that I think that she's saying goodbye to him, thinking that she's going to go off and die and leave him to live. Because, A, at this point, she doesn't know that she's going to be going alone with Rand, right? And I don't think that she would have left Lan behind if she had taken all the kids with her. So Lan would have been going with her. So maybe, like, she thinks they're both going to die? But I also, I think that if she thought that she was going to go without Lan he would have felt it in the bond. So I don't, I don't know. I don't think uh, it's a goodbye like that, where she's sending him off to live his life and she's going to go. 
I heard an interview with Rosamund Pike. I can't remember where. It must have been a podcast somewhere, uh, where she talked about how she uh, read the audiobook. She she has done her own version of Eye of the World. I haven't listened to it yet. I've heard really really good things. I do plan to listen to it at some point. Um, but how uh, when she got to the part of the book where she was like reading Land's story, she found herself in the middle of the recording, sobbing like uncontrollably sobbing. Because, you know, she's an actor who had embodied the character of Moraine, and she was feeling the character of Moraine's love for the character of Lan. And, like, the depth of that love, that level of love, I think, I think is what I'm mostly reacting to here. I'm I'm not entirely sure, though, because, I don't know, I just saw that every single time, this moment where she says, I like her, you know, the wisdom, every single time, it has brought tears to my eyes. I still have to ask, what are you doing, Nynaeve? Stalking this man around the forest, fortress. This this is not subtle. I know, like, she was doing this back in episode four, too, following him around the camp. This is weird. This is weird, Nynaeve. Stop doing this. I do not like this edit, where it looks like Lan just appears out of nowhere. I know that they were going for, at least I think I know that they were going for, oh, he's so stealthy and Nynaeve is so shocked, but... I watched a lot of reaction videos, and the amount of ones, like, almost all of them saw this and thought that something magical happened, and that's not what happened. Like, they conveyed a wrong message here. I think that what they needed to be, because what you see is you see Lan sitting, and then you see Nynaeve's face, and then Lan is there. I think there needed to be, like, Lan sitting, Nynaeve's face, empty seat, and then, then Lan, or something, like, something to give Lan time to move. It could still be really fast, but it doesn't... Right now, it looks like he did a magic trick. Like, he traveled. All right, so this Malkiri woman calls Nynaeve, Nynaeve Sedai. Why? <laughs> Can she sense Nynaeve's ability to channel? Like, is that why she called her Aes Sedai? Because I can't think of another reason for her to jump to that conclusion. Can you? Like, she's not wearing a ring. She's not, like, dressed super for like, Although neither is Moraine, but... Why would, like, you don't just assume every single woman that you meet is Aes Sedai in this world, I would assume. That would not be beneficial to anyone. So the only reason I can think of is that she could sense Nynaeve's ability to channel, but if she could sense it, then why couldn't Moraine? And I'm confused. I'm still confused about that. Here we have Nynaeve asking the others what their decision is, and she's obviously hoping that they say that they don't want to go because she's scared. And like in the book, she thinks being scared makes her a coward, but obviously that's not true, right? The fact that you see her stealing herself after they say that uh, they are they want to go, she doesn't want to do it, but she's preparing herself mentally to go because her people are going. And so she's going to go do something that terrifies her. That's the opposite of cowardice, I mean, I, oh, she doesn't get it. So that's it. Those are my uh, notes for episode seven. Have you been rewatching it along with me? Let me know uh, any new thoughts or new things that you've picked up in the comments below. Uh, what is your theory about that argument? Do you have a theory about what it was supposed to be? Because I don't think it was supposed to be what we got here, but they had to do something to like cover for Matt's absence. So what do you think? And uh, if you like my content and want to support me, uh, please consider checking out my Patreon. It will be linked in the description below. My patrons... I love you. Thank you so much. I've said it before. I mean it every time. It gives me so much motivation uh, to know that people want to support me. It means so much to me. Thank you so, so much. And uh, with that, I am going to end this here. So please like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye! <laughs>